we went to the getting ready for the final uh, evening of the celebration. They had a special thing for us to do. Four to five thousand Christians walked around the old city of Jerusalem. We had bands that were playing. We were singing. We were waving banners. We were waving the flags of our country. We walked around the city to illustrate to the Jewish people that there are Christians in the world who stand behind Israel. And we ended that march around the city by walking up this very steep Mount of Olives. When we got to the top, we stood there and watched the sun set over the city. And thousands of pilgrims sang hymns as the sun set. It was a very moving time. One of the persons that we had in our group was a man by the name of Terry Gibson. Terry was a trustee of our ministry at the time, pastor from the Houston, Texas area. When he got back to his room that night, Terry was so moved by what he had experienced here at Dominus Flevit and in that march around the city and in that sunset that he experienced over the city of Jerusalem that he sat down and began to write. He wrote a poem about the Eastern Gate, and that poem has since been published in several books. Here's what he wrote. There is a gate in waiting in the city of the king. It waits above the valley and adorns a tranquil scene. Jerusalem is churning on the north, the south, the west, yet the eastern gate waits quietly above multitudes at rest. On Olive Mount I stood one day and viewed this golden gate amid singing saints and setting sun. In the spirit was my state, looking o'er this glorious gate from atop that blessed mount. Two scenes of great events I saw and I now recount. One scene took place in ages past, the other is soon to be. In both there was the Son of God and this gate of destiny. The first scene was triumphant. They hailed him as a king. There were thousands in the valleys, and Hosanna's loud did ring. Many miracles of greatness had he done before their eyes, giving sight to the blind, calling forth the dead to rise. His disciples were elated as they joined this happy throng. But little did they know that their hopes would soon be gone. So long ago the prophet told that lowly he would come riding on a donkey's colt, unbefitting the righteous one. Yet thousands upon thousands stood in the valley on that day, and up the path to the eastern gate with palm branches did array. Save us, son of David, the multitude did cry, when suddenly the crowd did change, and they shouted, Crucify. Oh, what price our God did pay, while sinners yet we were. The mocking ones, the crown of thorns, pierced hands, what agony. And so the only Son of God was hung up on a cross. He had come to earth in godly love to save those who were lost. Then the scene did fade away, and another took its place. For Jesus had said He would return to redeem mankind's disgrace. On Olive Mount I stood again, I viewed the eastern gate, yet it was closed, sealed with stone, awaiting a king to coronate. Ezekiel long ago had said the gate would thus be so until the prince returned to earth. Then all the world would know. Around the city armies stood from nations of the world, and smoke and fire were everywhere. The armaments were hurled, yet the golden gate still quietly stood. While looking upward it seemed, suddenly the trump did sound. It was the coming of the king. And then I saw the Lord of lords descending from on high with multitudes of heavenly hosts behind him in the sky. He came and stood on Olive Mount, and then the earth did shake. He spoke, and all the armies fell, and the evil power did break. Upon a white and valiant steed down Olive Mount did ride through Kidron Valley up to the gate where the Jewish remnant cried. They looked on him whom they had pierced and grieved as for a son. So bitterly they wept in shame, yet with grace he did respond. And all the while the numbers grew of angels and the saints, millions upon millions joined him in the ranks. They sang Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna to the king. Throughout all heaven and earth the loud Hosannas ring. The gate is waiting the gate in waiting trembled, and the stones then blew apart, as the Holy One did enter His eternal reign to start. Oh, what sweetness in that day the redeem of God shall know. From Mount Zion in Jerusalem to living waters flow. Are you yearning for that day when the Lord of hosts shall come? 
or do you flee, flee in fear before the Holy One? Call upon His name before that coming day. Flee into His loving arms. He will wipe all the tears away. Wasn't that a powerful poem? You know, folks, I have read that many times to our pilgrimage groups, and each time it just blesses my soul. I want to shift gears here for a moment and point out that the Eastern Gate is not only significant in Bible prophecy, it also plays a key role in a debate that literally rages among archaeologists. That debate concerns the location of the ancient Jewish temple. The majority viewpoint today is that the Jewish temple was located here on the Temple Mount where the Dome of the Rock sits. Now, no one knows for sure where the ancient temple was located because the Temple Mount is under the administration of Muslims and they will not allow any excavations. The main reason this is the accepted position or location is because the dome sits directly over an outcropping of bedrock where there is drainage system for blood, and thus it's obviously an ancient altar. Those who disagree with this proposed location of the temple point to the eastern gate as evidence that the temple was really located about 250 feet north of the Dome of the Rock. They emphasize the fact that every year a red heifer was sacrificed on the Mount of Olives over here and then burned to get ashes for the purification of the Temple Mount. The Dead Sea Scrolls say that when the red heifer was sacrificed, the high priest stood on the steps of the temple, looked directly over the eastern gate to the pinnacle of the Mount of Olives. Well, that would of course place the temple to the north of the Dome of the Rock. Now, those who believe the temple was located where the dome sits always argue that the eastern gate must have been moved to the north after many destructions of the city of Jerusalem. But in 1969, evidence was accidentally discovered that the current eastern gate is located directly over the ancient gate. For that story, let's return to Jerusalem. The debate about the location of the temple relates to this particular gate which is called the Eastern Gate or the Beautiful Gate or the Golden Gate. Here's the reason it relates to it. When the Dead Sea Scrolls revealed that the high priest stood on the steps of the temple and looked directly over the Eastern Gate to the pinnacle of the Mount of Olives while they were sacrificing the red heifer, those who believe that the temple was located at the Dome of the Rock responded by saying, well, what happened is the Eastern Gate was moved north about 250 yards when the walls were rebuilt by Suleiman the Magnificent in the 1500s. But in 1969, an American student named Jim Fleming, who later... Do the Jewish people have any right to the land of Israel? Did they steal that land from the Palestinians? Did they create the modern day of state of Israel in violation of international law? Is there any hope for real peace in the Middle East between the Jews and the Arabs? And what does the Bible have to say about these questions? Stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. The focus of world politics today is the nation of Israel in the Middle East. And that focus is one of the many signs that we are living in the season of the Lord's return because all of end time Bible prophecy focuses on Israel, just like today's newspaper headlines. The world condemns Israel for stealing the land of the Palestinians. But is that true? I can tell you without hesitation that it is not true. The Bible says that God has given the Jewish people an eternal title to that land. The Bible also says that in the end times, God will regather the Jewish people to that land and reestablish their state. So, the bottom line is that the presence of the state of Israel in the Middle East today is in accordance with God's will. Stay tuned for a presentation of the biblical evidence. I have to share with you this evening is found in Genesis chapter 12 beginning with verse 1. And it uh, reads as follows. The Lord, and in your Bibles whenever that's capitalized that always means Yahweh, 
the name of God. Yahweh said to Abram, go forth from your country to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and will bless you, and make your name great, and to your descendants I will give this land, the land of Canaan. This promise was reconfirmed to Abraham six more times. In Genesis 17, 7, God declared the promise of the land to be an everlasting covenant. Not a temporary one, everlasting. And the promise was reconfirmed to Isaac and to Jacob, and it was reconfirmed through King David in Psalm 105, which reads as follows, Oh, give thanks to Yahweh, for He has remembered His covenant forever, the covenant which He made with Abraham, His oath to Isaac, then He confirmed it to Jacob and to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion of your inheritance. Now, there were actually two covenants related to the land of Israel. The first one is the one we just discussed, the land title covenant. This was given through Abraham, and it was an unconditional covenant. I'm giving the land, no conditions attached, it's yours, it's yours forever. The second was the land use covenant. This was given by God through Moses right before the children of Israel entered the land of Canaan. After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness just before they entered the land, God spoke through Moses, and in Deuteronomy 28 through 30, He gives the land use covenant. This is a covenant in which God makes it very clear to them that when they go into the land, they are to abide by certain rules, one of the most important being not intermarrying with the women of the land, because He said that would lead to idolatry. But there were many rules and regulations He gave them, and He told them that the enjoyment of the land would depend upon their faithfulness to God. If they were faithful, He would give them blessings. If they were unfaithful, He would put curses upon them. And there's a whole chapter of different kinds of curses, such as bad weather, such as loss of, and wars such as domination by foreign governments, such as rebellion by teenagers, divorce epidemics, crop failures, cattle dying. It goes on and on. All of the curses that God would put upon them if they were unfaithful to Him. And then it warned them that if they refused to repent, if they continued to sin against God, that it would ultimately lead to the greatest curse of all. And the greatest curse would be this, Deuteronomy 28, verse 64. Yahweh will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, and there you will serve other gods, and among those nations you shall find no rest, and there shall be no resting place for the sole of your foot. But there Yahweh will give you a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and despair of soul. What would be the ultimate uh, curse? Their dispersion to the four corners of the earth. Now, the crucial point to keep in mind is this. The gift of the land was irrevocable unconditional. The Jewish people were given an eternal title. But their use and enjoyment of the land was conditional. It depended upon their obedience to God. Let me illustrate this way. Let's suppose that you buy a car for your teenage son. And you put the car in his name. It belongs to him. But you sit down with him and you say, okay, now, as long as you live in my house, you're going to be under my rules and my regulations. The car is yours, but here are the rules. There's going to be no spinning of the tires, no racing, no speeding. And you go through all the rules. And you say to him, if you violate those rules, depending upon the severity of the violation, I'm going to take your car and I'm going to lock it up in the garage and you're not going to be able to drive it for a week or two weeks or for a month. The car is his. It belongs to him. But his use of it depends upon his obedience to his father's commands. And he can lose use of it for a period of time. Now, that is the situation with the children of Israel and the land. They were given an eternal title to the land, but their possession of the land was conditional upon their obedience to God. They were there for 750 years, 400 under the judges and 350 under the kings. But they were falling into idolatry. They began to intermarry with the Canaanite wives. They began to violate all the rules of God. God put remedial judgment after remedial judgment after remedial judgment, and they would not repent. And so, the time came when God began to raise up prophetic voices like Elijah, who called them to repentance. And again, they refused to repent. Until finally, the time came when God decided that He had to eject them from the land. The northern nation of Israel was ejected from the land by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. And the Babylonians captured Judah 136 years later in 586 B.C. But in His grace 
and His mercy. God allowed the Jews to return after 70 years in Babylonian captivity, and they rebuilt their temple in Jerusalem, but they continued in their rebellion against God. They continued to reject God, and when they rejected the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, God allowed the Romans to come in, conquer the city, burn their temple, and begin to put them all over the world. They were exiled to the four corners of the earth. By the beginning of the 20th century there were Australian Jews, there were African African Jews, there were Latin American Jews, there were Jews in every country of the world, just as God said He would do if they persisted in their rebellion. But again, the crucial point to keep in mind is they were dispersed from their land in discipline, but they were not dispossessed of their land. It was still their land. They still had the title to that land. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind. The title remained in their name, and it remains in their name to this day. And God gave them a promise one day. He gave them a promise that one day they would be regathered to that land. He said, one day even though you're dispersed the four corners of the earth, I'm going to bring you back to your land. This incidentally is the most prolific prophecy in the Hebrew Scriptures. This prophecy is made more times than any other one in the Hebrew Scriptures. Over and over like a broken record you hear this prophecy. Let me give you one example of it. Here it is in Isaiah chapter 11 beginning with verse 11. Then it will happen in that day. Now, in the book of Isaiah, every time he says in that day or on that day, every time with that exception, he's talking about the end times. And he says here, it will happen on that day that Yahweh will again recover the second time. The first time he brought them back was from Babylon. This is going to be a second regathering. A second time his hand will bring the remnant of his people who remain from Assyria and Egypt and Pathros and Cush and Elon and Shinar and Hamath and from the islands of the sea. That's a Jewish colloquialism for the whole world. And he makes that clear in the next verse. Look what he says. And he will lift up a standard for the nations, and will assemble the banished ones of Israel, and will gather the dispersed of Judah from where? From the four corners of the earth. Over and over and over that promise is made. Actually the Bible mentions two future gatherings of the Jewish people. The first one will be their gathering in unbelief before the Lord returns. That's going on right now. That is what's happening in Israel today and what has been happening ever since the beginning of the 20th century. The gathering in unbelief. Then the Bible prophesies, for example, there's many prophecies of this, but one of them is Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 2. There's going to be a second, another regathering, a gathering of believing Jews when Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, at his second coming, he's going to gather every believing Jew on planet earth who has put their faith in him during the tribulation, bring them back to the land of Israel, and establish Israel as the prime nation of the earth. And Jesus is going to reign from there as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So, two. Regatherings. One in unbelief going on now, one in belief after the Lord returns. Now, regarding the regathering in unbelief that's been going on all through the 20th century and continuing now, that particular regathering began, really, was set in motion in the late 1800s when God began to raise up prophetic voices in Europe calling the Jews to return to their homeland. I don't know how familiar you are with that, but in my book called, my latest book called uh, The Jewish People rejected or beloved. I have a whole chapter uh, about the Holocaust. And I point out in that chapter that God raised up many, many prophetic voices in Europe. And I name them who went all over Europe telling the Jewish people, a Holocaust is coming. You must get back home to Israel. You must do it now. And the people laughed. And they said, no, it's not going to happen. They thought they had been assimilated. They thought they had been accepted. And one of those prophetic voices was Theodore Herzl who spoke out strongly. And what caused him to become the leader of the movement, the Zionist movement, was this little booklet, a very short booklet. This is the, it was published in German, and it's the title of it is The Jewish State. And in that he said, folks, the time has come. A Holocaust is coming. We need to go back home. We need to establish a state of our own in our homeland. You must pull up your roots and start going back. Make Aliyah to Israel, he ordered. That particular booklet was anointed, and it captured the imagination of Jews all over the world. And it led in 1897 to the very first Zionist conference in Basel, Switzerland, where Herzl wrote in his diary, I believe that the Jewish state will exist within 50 years. He said, people may think I'm crazy, but I believe it. And guess what? 50 years later, in November of 1947, the United Nations voted to create the state of Israel. He was prophetic in his vision. In 1900, 
there were only 40,000 Jews in all of Israel. 40,000 in 1900. By the end of World War II, 600,000. Today, for the first time ever in just the past few months, there are now more Jews in Israel than were killed in the Holocaust. There are now more than 6 million Jews in Israel. They have been coming from every country in the world, speaking over 120 different languages. There's never been anything like it in all of history. Just stop and think that, about that for a moment. In the Bible, you read about all these nations against Israel, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Hittites, the Amorites, and it goes on and on and on. One guy said everything but the Chigarbites. They're all against Israel. Where are they today? They're all in the dustbin of history. Where is Israel? Regathered to their homeland. God is in control. God knows what's going to happen. And His will is being performed in history. Now, there were two key events, two key events that led to the regathering of the Jewish people. That was World War I and World War II. World War I prepared the land for the people. World War II prepared the people for the land. How did World War I prepare the land for the people? Well, most Americans are not aware of the fact that in World War I, the Germans whom we fought, and everybody knows we fought the Germans in World War I, but most do not realize we fought somebody else. The Germans had an ally, and their ally was the Ottoman Empire. Their ally was the Turks. When the Germans lost, the Turks lost. We not only divided up the German Empire, but we proceeded to divide up the Ottoman Empire, which was a great empire at that time, as you can see on this map. This was the last of the Muslim caliphates. And we divided it up after World War I. The British and the French in particular, the Americans were not so much involved in this, but they divided it up. And right in the middle of that Ottoman Empire was a tiny speck of land called Palestine. And that was given to the British. And as soon as it was given to the British, the British issued a document in November of 1917, which I believe is the first tangible sign in history that we were moving into the end times. And that was the Balfour Declaration. And in that declaration, the British announced that they were going to turn Palestine into a homeland for the Jewish people. Precisely, Lord Balfour wrote, His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. I tell you, Jews were electrified all over the world at the issuance of this particular document. And they rejoiced in the streets that long last they're going to have a homeland for the Jewish people. Not only them, but evangelicals as well, all over the world who knew God's prophetic word realized the importance of this, that we were finally moving into the end of the end times when the Jewish people were going to go back home and have their own land. Well, let me tell you something. In that time, Palestine looked like this. This was Palestine. Palestine was modern day Israel plus modern day Jordan. That's what was given to the British. That's what the British promised to the Jewish people. 45,000 square miles of territory. But in 1922, the British double crossed the Jewish people. In 1922, they stabbed them in the back because they realized that the Arabs were beginning to discover oil and they needed to curry favor with the Arab peoples. And so in 1922, they decided to divide Palestine into two parts and to give the majority of it, two thirds of it, to the Arab peoples, leaving the Jewish people a very small sliver of land that was only 10,000 square miles. Once again, the Jews felt like they had been double crossed, that they had been stabbed in the back, but they still wanted that little sliver of land. And so they prayed and they looked forward to the day when that little sliver of land would become their piece of land. Well, the second step was that World War II prepared the people for the land. Even when they were given this land. They did not go back in large numbers. They had to have a motivation to go back. And the horror of World War II, the horror of the Holocaust provided the motivation. When World War II was over and the Jews were released from the Holocaust, they came out of the Holocaust saying, never again, never again, never again will we live under a Hitler. We're going to have our own nation, our own government. We're going to rule ourselves. And they began to flood back into the land of Israel. World War I prepared the land for the people. World War II prepared the people for the land. And then in November of 1947, when the United Nations voted to create Israel, once again the Jewish people felt like that they had been betrayed. Because the United Nations voted to take that little sliver of land, only 10,000 square miles, and divide it 
equally between the Jews and the Arabs. As you look at that map, the light tan area, those three light tan areas were to be given to the Jews. The dark gray areas were to be given to the Arabs. And Jerusalem was to be an internationalized area. The Jews were despondent. They were, they were very upset. They, they felt like they had been betrayed. But they said, we want a state nonetheless. That has been our dream. And so they accepted the United Nations resolution very reluctantly, but received it. And on May the 14th, 1948 in a tiny little room in Tel Aviv, David Ben-Gurion stood up and read the Declaration of Independence and the State of Israel came into existence. Now, I want to tell you something at this point that I hope you'll never forget. It's something that no one ever mentions. On that very same day, the Arabs could have met in Ramallah and declared a Palestinian state. Because the United Nations voted to create two states. State for the Jews, state for the Arabs. The Jews accepted, created their state. The Arabs said, no, we want it all. They could have had a Palestinian state ever since 1948, but they said, no, we want it all. And so the next morning, five Arab states attacked Israel. Simultaneously from all directions determined to annihilate. They announced to the world, we will make the Mediterranean Sea run red with the blood of the Jews. And so they attacked. There was no hope for Israel, a tiny little nation, only 600,000 people. All they had were the primitive guns they had brought from the Warsaw Ghetto. There seemed to be no hope whatsoever, but they survived because the Arabs rejected and have done so over and over. There's been three or four times when they could have had a Palestinian state and they turned it down because they want it all. And because of that, the greatest diplomat in the history of Israel, Abba Iban, made this statement, the Palestinians have never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Their worst, their worst enemies have always been their leaders, their leaders who are determined that they will settle for nothing less than the destruction of Israel. Incidentally, the attack by the Arab nations the next morning after the Declaration of Independence was the fulfillment of a fascinating prophecy. There are many prophecies about the reestablishment of Israel in the end times, but my favorite is a symbolic prophecy. Look at this. Isaiah chapter 66, 7 and 8. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she gave birth to a boy. How many of you women have ever given birth before the birth pains? They come before the birth. This says, no, it's going to be after the birth. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? And then the birth pains came? That's exactly what happened. On May the 14th, 1948, the nation of Israel was declared. The next morning, five Arab nations attacked. And since that time, there has been constant birth pangs, constant wars. There was the War of 1948 and 49, the War of Independence. There was the Suez War in 1956. There was the Six-Day War in 1967. There was the Yom Kippur War in 1963. The Lebanese War in 1982. The first Intifada, the first uh, Arab uprising in Israel from 87 to 93. There was the first Gulf War from 90 to 91. There was the second Arab uprising from 2000 to 2000. 2005. There was the Hezbollah War in 2006, the uh, Gaza War in 2009, the second Gaza War in 2014. There, the Israelis, from the moment they were given birth, have lived in a constant state of war. One war after another after another. The birth pangs have continued. But Israel, surrounded today by 350 million Arabs, has continued to exist. It is a miracle of God. And let me tell you something, they will continue to exist. The end time prophecies make that very clear. Look at this from Zechariah 12, 6. In that day, again, Zechariah, when he uses that term, he's talking about the end times. In that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot among pieces of wood and a flaming torch among sheaves, so that they will consume on the right hand and on the left all the surrounding peoples. There's going to be a miraculous revival of military power among the Israelis in the end times, and that's exactly what has happened. Okay, let's shift gears for a moment and talk about the Arabs and where they fit into all of this. Just as God made a covenant with the Jews, He made one with the Arab peoples. Most people are not aware of this. He made a covenant with the Arab peoples. And you can find that covenant in Genesis 16 and 17. What was the, uh, the promises that God made to the descendants of Ishmael? Very interesting. Look what He told them. I will multiply your descendants exceedingly. Today there's 350 million Arabs. He said, I will make them a great nation. And they are. He said, I will give them all the land east of Canaan. And he has. Number four, I will give them a personality like a wild donkey. 
Very interesting. Number five, they will have a warlike spirit. Their hand will be against everyone. Those are the promises God made about the descendants of Ishmael. And let's look at their fulfillment. Today, here's the Arab world where you see that, that, that patch of land and gold. That's the Arab world. God said, I'm going to give you a lot of land. And He gave them a lot of land. There are now more than 350 million Arabs, and there are 22 Arab nations. The Arabs have 5.3 million square miles of oil-rich land. They are characterized by an inability to get along with anyone, including themselves. I mean, if Israel were to disappear tomorrow, there would still be wars in the Middle East. There was a war, and over 1 million people were killed, a war between Iran and Iraq. And then Iraq invades Kuwait and wants to take over all the Middle East. They don't even get along with each other, much less the rest of the world. By comparison, there is only one Jewish state with a population of 6 million squeezed into an area of only 8,000 square miles. You would think the Arabs would be satisfied, but no. They want that territory. They want to destroy Israel. Folks, that's a population ratio of 60 to 1 and a land ratio of 662 to 1. And regarding the Palestinians, it's very interesting. From 70 A.D. until 1948 when Israel was established, Jerusalem was never the capital of any Arab state. It has never been the capital of any Arab state, only of Jerusalem. Number two, there was never a Palestinian state. You know, they tell you today that the problem in the Middle East is that Israel, the Jews came in and they ran all the Palestinians out and took over their state. There was no Palestinian state, never a Palestinian state. The Arabs who lived in that area considered themselves to be Syrians. And let me tell you, very few lived there. Most of the people were absentee landlords. The area was a wasteland. When the Jews left, the area of Israel became a wasteland. By the 20th century, there were only 17,000 trees left in all of Israel. Only 17,000. There was not a single tree south of the Sea of Galilee. What in the world is going on in the Middle East? Why is the region embroiled in such turmoil? What is ISIS all about? And how does the rise of ISIS relate to the regathering of the Jewish people to their homeland? And what is the biblical significance of the events in the Middle East? Stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. The focus of world politics today is the nation of Israel in the Middle East, and that focus is one of many signs that we're living in the season of the Lord's return, because all of end times Bible prophecy focuses on Israel, just like today's newspaper headlines. The Middle East today is a cauldron of turmoil, and much of that turmoil has been stirred up by a mysterious group called ISIS that seems to come out of nowhere. What is this group? What are they all about? And how do they relate to what the Bible says about Israel and the Arabs in the end times? Stay tuned for a presentation that will seek to answer these questions. Where in the world does ISIS fit into this picture? ISIS is a Sunni Muslim group that has transformed rapidly a terrorist group into a full-fledged army, and I mean rapidly. The group was founded by this man, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. He's a recluse. He keeps to himself. I think he's afraid of assassination. He never stays the same place in, in a night. He's moving around all the time. He's only made two public appearances since he formed ISIS. He is a real recluse. And very, very little is known about this uh, particular uh, man. Uh, What we do know is that um, uh, he became the leader of an Al-Qaeda group, an Al-Qaeda group that was called ISI, standing for the Islamic State of Iraq. That's what they call themselves. And because of that he began to launch terror attacks across Iraq with the idea of taking over Iraq and turning it into a Muslim, a pure Muslim state with Sharia law. In 2013, He ventured into Syria and he changed the name of his group to 
ISIS, standing for the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. He later changed it again to ISIL, Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Levant is a French word which means the Middle East. So you can see how he's expanding it. It starts out with Iraq, then it goes to Iraq and Syria, then it goes to Iraq and the entire Middle East. And then in his most important public appearance in June of 2014 where he made a public speech for the first time, he declared the establishment of the Islamic State. And that's what he calls it today, IS, I-S, the Islamic State. He didn't call it ISIL or, or ISIS, he calls it IS. And that is the Islamic State. And let me tell you, that was the most important pronouncement that had been made by a Muslim in many, many years. Keep in mind that no Muslim caliphate, no Muslim empire has existed since the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire in 1922. When he declared an Islamic State, an Islamic caliphate, Muslims, radical Muslims at least, all over the world became excited. And they began to flood into the Middle East because they wanted to be a part of the establishment of the next Muslim caliphate, the next Muslim empire which they hope will be the empire that will take over the world. Let's consider for a moment what motivates these people. Folks, in February of 2015, this lady, Marie Half, a State Department spokesman, made the most incredible proclamation I think has ever come out of the mouth of a government employee. She said that the motivation of ISIS is the desire to get jobs. That these are people who need jobs. Here is her actual words. We cannot win the war on terror nor can we win the war on ISIS by killing them. Oh. We need to find them jobs. We need to get to the root cause of terrorism, and that is poverty and the lack of opportunity in the terrorist community. This is liberal thinking gone to seed. It is just pathetic, pathetic. This perverse idea that ISIS is driven by poverty and the need for a job. One of my, one of my staff members who doesn't even know anything about this, when I told him about this, he said, Dave, This is insane. I haven't heard one member of ISIS yet yelling, jobs, jobs, jobs. (laughs) He said all they seem to be yelling is, Alu Akbar, Alu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. The real motivation, of course, is religion and specifically the commands of the Quran. Now, these are verses right out of the Muslim holy book. To fight non-Muslims until you exterminate all other religions, leaving Islam as the one and only religion in the world. What are they doing? They're following the dictates of their holy book. Muhammad is quoted in the Hadith as saying, I have been ordered to fight with the people until they say, none has the right to be worshipped except Allah. ISIS has become very quickly identified by their use of indescribable widespread radical terror. And this is in accordance with the Quran. In addition to military force, the Quran orders Muslims to terrorize non-Muslims. Surah 860, strike terror in the hearts of the enemies of Allah and in your enemies. And Allah then assures His followers that He will help them do this. I will instill terror in the hearts of unbelievers. Smite them above their necks and smite all their fingertips off them. It is not you who slay them, it is Allah. And concerning jihad or holy war, He says the Quran guarantees paradise to those who fight for Allah. In fact, in the Muslim religion, the only guarantee you have that you will go to heaven is if you die in combat fighting for Allah. Otherwise there is no guarantee whatsoever. Even Mohammed said he wasn't sure whether he would go to heaven or not. And dying for Allah is presented as better than living. And if you are killed or die in the way of Allah, forgiveness and mercy from Allah are far better than all that others may amass of worldly wealth. It's a great thing to die for Allah. Also, martyrs are promised a, a, a sensual and luxurious life in paradise. In short, the Muslim paradise is one of eternal decadence. Let's consider for a moment the purpose of ISIS. We don't have to guess at it. We don't have to guess at their purposes because they have made this very, very clear. And you'll be surprised at what their number one goal is. Their number one goal always has been to overthrow the secular rulers of Islamic states. That's why Egypt is number one on their hit list. They want to take out the the secular leaders of Egypt and get someone in there who is an ayatollah, who is a a, a, a cleric type individual. They want to take out all of the secular leaders of all the Islamic countries. And that will then produce 
their Islamic caliphate. Number two is to take back the land of Palestine for Allah, exterminating Israel in the process. One of the reasons they're so determined to do that is because the Quran teaches that if you ever conquer a land for Allah, it becomes His. That He only owns the land you conquer. And that if you lose that land, you have have an absolute obligation to go back and conquer it again. That's interesting. The Bible says the whole world belongs to our God. But according to the Quran, the only thing that belongs to Allah is what has been conquered by the sword. And the Ayatollah Khomeini argued that the reason that the, that the, uh, uh, the Arabic countries, the Muslim countries had fallen into such disrepair in the 18th and 19th centuries simply was because they sat on the sidelines and allowed Israel to be established. And they have an obligation to destroy Israel. Number three is to conquer the rest of the world for Allah. And that includes, of course, the United States of America. Those are the three purposes of ISIS. Now it's important to note something here. Very important. The eradication of Israel is not the top priority. Nor is Israel viewed as a major obstacle to world conquest. I want to emphasize this because many Americans now are saying that we are to abandon Israel, we are to dump Israel. I see these bumper stickers all over the place. It's amazing. You turn on the radio, you hear people saying this. Abandon Israel, dump Israel. Many Americans are saying, if we will just abandon Israel and dump Israel, we'll have peace. Then the Muslims will leave us alone. They won't attack us anymore. Folks, that is so misguided. It is so misguided. It's utter nonsense. Israel is not the cause of Islamic terrorism toward the West. If Israel were to disappear tomorrow, fundamentalist Islam would still be determined to destroy America and to take the world for Allah. And if we were to abandon Israel, if that were to happen, and we're on the verge of doing it, we are right on the verge. The Muslim world would interpret that as cowardice. They would interpret it as proving that our word is meaningless, and they would say that we have proved what they say about us, that we are a depraved society devoid of values. The Arab world respects only strength, only strength. Let me give you an example of that. When the Arabs conquered the old city of Jerusalem in the War of Independence in 1948 and 49, and they conquered the old city. You know what they did? They went to the Jewish quarter. And they blew up every synagogue in the Jewish quarter. They burnt every Jewish house to the ground. The entire Jewish quarter was obliterated. Then they went to the Mount of Olives and they desecrated all the Jewish cemeteries. And they took the stones from the Jewish cemeteries and took them out and used them as stepping stones to the latrines of the army camps. In 1967, when the Jews reconquered the city of Jerusalem, there was panic throughout the Muslim world. Because they expected the Jews to do to them as they had done to the Jews. They expected the Jews to go in and burn the Arab quarter to the ground, blow it up. They expected the Jews to blow up the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount. And the Jews never even touched the Arab quarter. And they never touched the Temple Mount. And in fact, the second day after they had won it, they called a press conference and said to the Arabs, we believe in freedom of religion. And although this now belongs to us, we're going to let you administer the Temple Mount. And to this day, even though the Temple Mount is under the sovereignty of Israel, when you go up there, you're under control of Muslims. You can't touch your wife's hand. You can't read the Bible. You can't pray. You have to obey all their rules. The Jews thought this would prove to the Arabs that they wanted to live in peace with them. To the Arab mind, all that the Jews did there was a sign of weakness. They don't have the will to destroy our quarter. They don't have the will to destroy the Dome of the Rock. These are weak people. And one day we will conquer them. The only thing they respect is power. And let me tell you, this thing of trading land for peace whets the appetite of the aggressor and only makes them want more. They said, oh, there will be peace, peace if you would just give us the Gaza Strip. They gave them the Gaza Strip. What did they do? Move all the terrorists in and start shooting rockets into Israel. You don't get peace through appeasement. As Winston Churchill once said, appeasement never works because when you go down that road, sooner or later you're going to be eaten by the crocodile. (laughs) And that's exactly what happens with appeasement. Do you remember Chamberlain who tried to appease Hitler? Do you know what Chamberlain said on his deathbed? He said it would have all been all right if Hitler hadn't lied to me. (laughs) Well, what, what do you expect Hitler to do? Right now we're negotiating with Iran. What do you expect Iran to do? They're going to lie to us. They don't care anything about truth. They don't care anything about honor or valor. They're going to do whatever they can to get ahead and produce that nuclear bomb so they can drop it on Israel. 
Well, folks, what is going to be? Uh, I, I love this. This is a quote from Netanyahu. He says, the Nazis wanted to establish the master race. ISIS wants to establish the master faith. And he is right on target. A man who always is able to see through it all. What's going to be the fate of ISIS? What's going to happen to them? Well, I can say with confidence here what's going to happen to them because the Bible makes it very clear. First, Psalm, I'm sorry, I've got on there Psalm 38. That's a mistake. It should be Psalm 83. I apologize for that. Psalm 83 indicates that Israel will be attacked in the end times by a coalition of Muslim states that share a common border with the Jewish state. In other words, those Arab states that have a common border with Israel are going to all attack Israel in the end times. And it says they will attack them for the purpose of wiping out the nation of Israel. That would today include Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Egypt and the Gaza Strip. And what's going to happen? The Psalm doesn't tell us, but the Bible tells us. It's going to see here, wipe out Israel as a nation. And here's the ones that are going to do the attacks. You can see them right there. And what's going to be the result? Zechariah 12.6 says that in the end times Israel will be like a fire pot among pieces of wood and a flaming torch among sheaves so that they will consume on the right hand and on the left all the surrounding peoples. In that day the Lord God, Yahweh, Yahweh will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. Israel, tiny Israel, the size of the state of New Jersey is going to be like David against Goliath in the end times. Zechariah 12, 9, and in that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. There's no doubt, ISIS, fate is already settled. God is going to destroy them sooner or later if they try to come against Israel. It's probably during that time that the prophecy is going to be fulfilled. It's mentioned twice in the Bible, Isaiah 17 and Jeremiah 4 and 9. It says, that in one of these wars of the end times Damascus will be destroyed and will never be built again. I suspect that Damascus will start hitting Israel with uh, missiles that contain poisonous gas. And I suspect that the Israelis will respond with nuclear weapons blowing Damascus off the face of the earth. But we know for sure Damascus will cease to exist. And then will come the war of Gog and Magog. It's mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Here's what I think is going to happen. Now, this is just speculation, but here's what I think is going to happen. That after the war of Psalm 83, when the Jewish IDF, the, the, the military force, conquers all the Arab forces, the Arab nations will be in a panic, and they will turn to their natural ally, which is Russia, and they will call for Russia to come to their aid. And Russia will come down with all of its current allies, which happen to be Turkey and Iran and, and others like that, and they're all Muslim states. And they will come. So first you have the war of the inner ring, and now you have the war of the outer ring of states around Israel called the war of Gog and Magog. And so great will be the invasion at that time of Israel by Russia and all of its allies. It will be beyond anything that the Israeli forces can handle. And so we're told that God will handle it. We're told that God will destroy all these armies supernaturally upon the mountains of Israel. Look at this, Ezekiel 38, 18. It will come about on that day when God comes against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, that my fury will mount up in my anger. In my zeal and in my blazing wrath, I declare that on that day there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, and all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. I will call for a sword against him, Gog and his allies. On all my mountains, declares the Lord God, every man's sword will be against his brother. With pestilence, with blood, I will enter into judgment with him, and I will rain on him and on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. I will magnify myself and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am Yahweh, the Creator. God is going to handle these Muslim nations. They don't have a chance. <laughs> Franklin Graham recently affirmed this particular scenario of end times. He said the evil of ISIS really shouldn't shock us. It is fully in keeping with their ultimate agenda of hastening a final apocalypse. God's Word tells us that there will be a final battle one day, and it will result in the defeat of Satan and all those allied with him. One thing is for sure, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In that regard, I am reminded of a presentation made a year ago by my dear friend Al Guest who has a prophecy ministry in Louisiana. He was speaking at the Louisiana Prophecy Conference in Lake Charles, and he spoke on ISIS. 
And in the process he began to tell about how in his research he discovered all these different names that IC led to ISIS to ISIL to IS. (laughs) And he was explaining this to his dear wife Sandy who has one of the greatest senses of humor I've ever run across in my life. And he said Sandy sat there for a moment and she looked at all that and she looked up sort of confused and he said, Honey, I don't know much about all this but I know one thing for sure. She said, the great I am is going to convert is to was. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) And all I can say is amen. Well, this brings us to some crucial questions. Why has God regathered the Jews? Second, what is likely future of of Israel? And third, what does it all mean to us, a group of Gentiles here in Katy, Texas, at the beginning of the 21st century? The first question is easy. Why has God regathered the Jews? It's because it is part of His plan to bring a great remnant of the Jews to faith in Yeshua as their Messiah. And what is that plan? Well, the first step is to regather the Jews to Israel. The second step is to bring the nations against them over the issue of Jerusalem. That's happening now. The third step is to hammer them until they come to the end of themselves. That's the tribulation resulting in the salvation of a great remnant who will turn to God in repentance. And thus the future of Israel is a period of great tribulation that will bring the Jews to the end of themselves, but the pouring out of God's wrath will be followed by showering of His glorious grace. For when Jesus returns and comes to the Mount of Olives we are told that the city of Jerusalem will be surrounded by the Antichrist and his forces. It will be about to fall. He will come to the Mount of Olives. When his foot touches the mountain, it'll split in half. It says the remnant will come out of the city. They will come up to the Mount of Olives and they're going to bow before him and they're going to cry out, Baruch Abba Bashim Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is an illustration by a Messianic Jew from Israel. Folks, it's going to be a glorious day when this great remnant comes to the Lord Jesus Christ and acknowledges him as their Messiah. What a glorious, glorious day that will be. In fact, Jesus Himself said, I will not return to this earth until the Jewish people are willing to say, Baruch Abba, Bashem, Adonai. Now, what does this mean to us, to a group of Gentiles here? What does it mean to us? Well, there are many things, but I just want to mention two. One, it's a great testimony of God's faithfulness. Folks, He is fulfilling prophecy after prophecy that was made to the Jewish people thousands of years ago. I want you just to consider a few of the prophecies that He has been fulfilling in our day and time. He has regathered them from the four corners of the earth just as He said He would. He has reestablished their state just as He said He would. He has revived their language from the dead just as He said He would. He has restored the city of Jerusalem as their capital just as He said He would. He has enabled them to reclaim the, claim their land from the wilderness it had become just as He said He would. He has provided them with a resurgence of military strength And he has refocused all of world politics upon them. He says in the end times the whole world will come against Israel. Second, what is happening is evidence of the Lord's soon return. Folks, these prophecies, the fulfillment of these prophecies is literally shouting the soon return of Jesus. Like God has a neon sign in the sky saying Jesus is coming soon, Jesus is coming soon. We are witnessing the fulfillment of Bible prophecy before our very eyes. And we can be assured that if God is faithful to fulfill every promise He's made to the Jewish people, He's going to be faithful to fulfill every promise He's made to you and me, to His church. There are glorious promises He's made to us. He has said that one day very soon, any day, there's not one prophecy that has to be fulfilled for this, that one day very soon an angel is going to appear in the heavens. He's going to blow a trumpet and He's going to shout. And when that happens the Lord Jesus Christ is going to appear. He's not going to come back to earth. He's just going to appear. And the graves of the believers are going to be emptied. He's going to bring with Him, it says in the Thessalonian letters, it says He's going to bring with Him the spirits of the dead who are in heaven with Him. And He's going to resurrect their bodies in a great miracle of recreation. Listen, this is the one who spoke and the whole world came into being. And there's nothing for Him to speak and the bodies to come back together. Whether they be burned, whether they be in the sea, whether they be in the ground, whether they be decayed, whatever, they're going to come back together in a great miracle of recreation. In the instant of an eye He's going to take their spirits and He's going to put them back together with their bodies. And He's going to glorify their bodies and give them an eternal body. And then those of us who are alive when that happens, and I hope I am, 
We are going to be translated up following them to meet Him in the sky. And on the way up we're going to be translated from mortal to immortal in the twinkling of an eye. We won't even experience death, the generation that's alive on that day. People say, you cannot, there's only two things you cannot escape and that's death and taxes. No, it's just taxes and more taxes. There's a whole generation <laughs> that will escape death. On the way up when we meet the Lord in the sky we're going to be given glorified bodies. We're going to be taken to Heaven. He's going to judge us of our works, not to determine our eternal salvation, but to determine determine our degrees of reward. And He's going to hand out all kinds of degrees of reward. And at the end of the tribulation we're going to be in Heaven while that's going on. At the end we're going to sit down with Him at the greatest feast the cosmos had ever experienced. The marriage feast of the Lamb. And he's, we're going to sit with Him and we're going to celebrate our union with Him. And at the end He's going to stand up and He says, go, let's go. And He's going to get on that white horse and He's going to break from the heavens. And we're going to come with Him. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but it says we're coming with Him. Hundreds of millions of glorified Saints, I, I, you know, I've had a vision of this that that the Lord comes back to the Mount of Olives, and hundreds of millions of glorified saints are in the sky above, and many are in the Kidron Valley filling it. And He's going to replay a day in His life once before He came to the Kidron Mountain, once before He got up there uh, on the Mount of Olives, and He got on a donkey and He rode it down in the Kidron Valley and up to that eastern gate. And people yelled, "Hosanna to the Son of God! Hosanna to the Son of David!" And then a week later, they were yelling, "Crucify Him! Crucify Him!" Well, this time we're going to be there. In our glorified bodies. And we're going to be yelling, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna to the Son of God. Let me tell you, I can hardly wait. Every time I sing a song that has Hosanna in it I get goosebumps because I know one day I'm going to be there to see this. And he's going to ride that great white war charger down and read Psalm 20. People who had sworn their allegiance to the Antichrist. So some kind of tattooing has certainly evolved. Magnetic inks can store a person's financial, personal, and health information. And then digital readers could scan the ink in order to authorize whether that person is allowed to buy or sell. Maybe RFID microtrip is also involved, embedded in a rice-sized glass case underneath the readable mark. Global commerce also needs a way to collect all of that countless terabytes of information. And so it would require the constructing of giant data centers in order to store a planetary population full of data. That data would need to move lightning fast using high-speed internet connectivity, complex e-commerce systems, wireless networks, billion-dollar satellites, and so on. The closest system we have today to the mark of the beast is China's social credit score, which has already been instituted in their more populated cities. The Chinese government has positioned millions of cameras everywhere in order to spy on their citizens. Computer algorithms then rate the citizens' allegiance to the government, granting benefits to those who are more loyal and restrictions on those the computer deems as not being patriotic enough. Just imagine that horribly restrictive system instituted on a global scale. All of these e-commerce technologies which make today's buying and selling so much easier are actually all coming together so that the Antichrist control all of the world's commerce and thereby control all the people under his rule. A lot of fear surrounds taking the mark of the beast, and rightly so. For those who take it, God says, will have lost their hope of becoming saved. But we today should have no fear of accidentally taking the mark, for it will not be instituted until halfway through the tribulation, well after the church has been raptured up to heaven. Therefore, don't sweat chips and barcodes and credit cards. They have nothing to do with the mark of the beast, yet. Today's global e-commerce network points to the fact that Jesus Christ is returning soon. Sign number four is actually a wonderful sign, for it's a positive one. This sign prophesies that the entire world will be evangelized in the end times. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. God wants the church to preach the good news of His salvation to the entire world, and so He's provided us with powerful communication tools for sharing the gospel. Today's exponential curve in communication technology has played a vital role in reaching more of the world for Christ than has ever been reached in the previous 19 centuries. Technologies such as cameras and microphones, televisions and tablets, smartphones and cell towers, communication networks and satellites, the internet and the airwaves, big media and social media, they all work together to form the largest pulpit the world has ever known. And while all these breathtaking technologies are leading people to Christ by the thousands each day, the entire world, as Jesus referred to it, will not all hear the gospel before the rapture happens. That blessing awaits the second coming at the end of the tribulation. Communication technologies will continue to spread the gospel to the post-rapture world. In addition, God will send forth 144,000 Jewish evangelists 
the two witnesses, and even the gospel angel to preach throughout the whole world. Every person on the planet will be evangelized by the end of the tribulation. God will leave no person without a chance to choose his son and so be saved. Today's communication technologies point to the fact that Jesus is returning soon. The fifth sign involves the living image of the Antichrist. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak. Revelation reveals that during the tribulation, the Antichrist will order his false prophet to set up an image of himself in the newly built Jewish temple and order the world to worship him as if he were God. This is the same scenario all over again when the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar set up a statue of himself and ordered everybody to worship it. Daniel tells of how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused and so were thrown into a fiery furnace. This is all going to happen again during the tribulation, but instead of chucking people into ovens, the false prophet will rain down fire and incinerate those people who refuse to worship the Antichrist. How will the false prophet make fire fall down from the sky and consume people? Assuming there's nothing supernatural going on, let's look at the technologies involved in producing pyrotechnics. Maybe it was John was referring to jets or drones, dropping bombs and other incendiary weapons. And satellite-based weapon systems, such as missiles or laser systems, could simply zap people from high up in orbit. Remember that the Antichrist must use technology because he is a counterfeit. His false prophet will not be a real miracle maker, and so will use today's military technology to destroy people with just the touch of a button. What's so peculiar about the story of this image is that John revealed that it was given life. Nebuchadnezzar's statue didn't get up and walk around and sing and dance and all that. It didn't even move, but the image of the Antichrist will appear to be alive. Assuming there's nothing supernatural involved in making the illusion of a living statue, such as the demonic possession of an object, statues after all still can't move. They lack the proper joints and musculature. What kinds of technology could the false prophet use then to make the image move? John may have been the very first person to watch television. The Antichrist image may appear at regular intervals on a person's TV set or mobile device, and once broadcast, everyone is expected to fall down and worship his image. Or the image may involve robotic and artificial intelligence, AI technologies. How about a fully functional hologram? Japan especially has been hard at work developing both robotic and holographic technologies. Why, for years now, one of Japan's biggest pop stars has been Hatsune Miku, who is a fully interactive hologram that sings in live concerts. With the proper Alexa-like technology, the Antichrist living image, be it robot or hologram, could fully interact with his adoring acolytes. Today's weapons and robotic technologies point to the fact that Jesus Christ is returning soon. The rebellion in Africa, he must turn his loyal forces north to deal with the rebellion coming from the east. Both armies meet in the Valley of Armageddon, located in northern Israel. While these armies are busy slaughtering each other, they will see Jesus and his armies returning out of the heavens and unite against him. The King of Kings will easily defeat the world's armies just by speaking. The blood from the vanquished armies will flow as high as a horse's head for a staggering 180 miles. By the end of the tribulation, most of the world's population will have been wiped out, and still these prophesied kings of the east can amass a 200 million man army. This prophecy must have just blown John's mind, for in his first century day, there were only 200 million people living on the whole earth. How then does the human population get so large that despite